This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Memoir 44. Memoir 44 is probably the best gateway game for learning tactical level wargaming. Today we'll be learning the base rules, but as you can see from this chart, there are plenty of other expansions you can get that cover other aspects of World War II. Memoir 44 utilizes the Command and Colors system, which is also used in a lot of other light tactical war games. So if you like what you see here, there are other games you can explore that use this system. Memoir 44 is a Days of Wonder property, and as you can see here, it's very high quality. The core game comes with 16 different scenarios that you can play out, all themed around the D-Day invasions in Normandy. After that, there are plenty of expansions, as well as, if you buy multiple copies of Memoir 44, you can connect the boards and fight Overlord scenarios, which are giant tactical wars. For this tutorial, we're going to set up Pegasus Bridge, which is Scenario 1 in the Memoir 44 booklet. So get your bits together, people. It's time to set up the game. So in Step 1, you're going to place the playing board showing the countryside in the middle of your play area. In step two, you're going to place the terrain hexes. The core game has just enough river hexes for the Pegasus Bridge scenario, so I'd start there first. Plus, it's in the corner of the board, so once you lay the river, it's much easier to find out where you need to lay the rest of the hexes. Since these are double-sided tiles, some of the river tiles are shared with the forest tiles, so if you lay them out of order, you might have to hunt around until you find your river tiles. Let's just say I learned that the hard way. In step three, you're going to lay the barbed wire units, the bridges, the badges, and sandbags. A quick note, the components for the barbed wire look a lot better in real life than they do in this picture. Every time I look at this picture, it seems like the Germans are involved in some nefarious farming operation and have got all these giant round hay bales or giant dinosaur uh, coprolites. Sorry, Days of Wonder. In step four, we're gonna place the infantry units. And the best way to go about this is to place one at a time on each of the locations and then fill them in up to four. In step five, shuffle and place the command deck. In step six, each player is gonna take four of the battle dice. Okay, now that Pegasus Bridge is set up, it's time for a mission briefing. June 5th, 1944. Late in the night, Major John Howard leads a group of Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry on a critical mission. Their mission? Launch the first airborne assault on D-Day, capture two bridges, and prevent the German armor from crossing and attacking the eastern flank of the Normandy landings at Sword Beach. Major Howard's men board six Horsa gliders on a secret airfield in Dorset and are towed to Normandy. A few minutes past midnight, now June 6th, D-Day, the gliders clip through the treetops toward the targets. They land, okay, more of a crash, in a small patch of rough field between a pond and the Cayenne Canal, only yards away from their objective. Major Howard and his troops pour out of their glider, achieving complete surprise and rushing to stun German forces. Now, the stage is set, the battle lines are drawn, and you are in command. The rest is history. The overall objective for this scenario is to earn four medals to win. Allies have the initiative, which means they go first. In this scenario, the Allies earn medals of honor by seizing and holding the bridge until they get their four medals, or they get a medal for every Axis unit destroyed. The Axis player needs to hold off the Allies and earn their four Iron Crosses. They get an Iron Cross every time they destroy an Allied unit. Once either side has their four medals, the game is over. So let's show you how this works. Allies go first, so on the Allies' turn, Phase 1, you're going to play a Command card. In the Pegasus Bridge scenario, Major Howard surprises the Germans with his attack, so the Germans start with two command cards. The Allies begin with six command cards. 
Command cards are important because they allow you to activate your unit so that you can move or battle. You'll notice that the board is divided up into three sections. When you play a command card, that command card tells you which units in which sections you can activate. Let's pause and look at the command cards. So there are 60 command cards in the deck, which are divided up into 40 section cards and 20 tactic cards. First, let's look at the section cards. You can quickly identify the section cards versus the tactic cards because the section cards have a green background. The tactic cards have a gray background. I've laid out this diagram to show you how each of the section cards are played. The board is divided into three sections, the left section, the center section, and the right section. A section card will tell you which section you can activate units in and how many of those units you can activate. For example, let's say you want to play a center section probe card. This will allow you to activate two units in the center section. There are also a few cards you'll see at the top that allow you to activate units in multiple sections. Now, there are some hexes on the board that straddle two sections. When you have a unit in these hexes, they can be activated in either section. Each of the cards activate a greater number of units in that section. For example, if you play a recon card, it allows you to activate one unit but this is balanced out by allowing you to draw two command cards during your next draw phase and then select one of them. A major strategy in the command and color system is finding out a way to use the available section cards you have and align your card play with the position of the units on the board. So the section cards tell you which sections and how many units you can activate, but let's look at the tactic cards and see what they do. There are several kinds of tactic cards, and I've tried to organize them here to give you an idea of the different groupings they fall into. The first group is unit level activation. Basically, these cards allow you to activate certain units in any section on the board. The cards are also designed so if you don't have that particular unit, you can use it to move one unit of your choice. For example, if I don't have any artillery, like I don't in this scenario, I can use my artillery bombard card to still move one unit on the board. So you never get a dud card. You've always got a card you can use. It's just some cards are more useful in other scenarios. There are also position-based tactic cards, which have specific positions you need to be in to execute them. You've got reversal cards, which basically allow you to replay the card your opponent played for yourself. Barrage and air power are long distance attack cards. So basically you can conduct attack on a unit anywhere on the board with these cards. Finally, there's fortification cards, which allow you to replenish fallen units or add sandbags to an area. Now back to our game, you can see why it's so important that the Germans were surprised during the attack because they only get two command cards to start. The allies get six command cards, so they have a lot more options to attack with. It's going to take a couple of turns for the Germans to up their command cards to their full strength, which in this scenario is four. As the Allies player, I'm going to use the Recon and Force section card. This allows me to activate a unit in each section on the board. So now that I've played my section card, let's move to Phase 2 and order some units. Okay, we played the Recon and Force card, so we can order one unit in the left flank, one unit in the center, and we could order one unit in the right flank but we don't have a unit there. So for my two units I get to activate, I'm going to activate the ones that I've highlighted in red on the board. Now that I've chosen which units to activate, it's time to move them. So we move to phase three. Let's talk about movement. This scenario, Pegasus Bridge, only utilizes infantry. So we're just going to look at the infantry units for now. 
you really have two options. You can move your infantry two hexes and not battle, or you can move your infantry one hex and you can battle up to three hexes out. Notice when you shoot, the farther out you shoot, the less dice you get to use and the less damage you can cause. We'll cover this more in the battle section, but just be aware that the strategy is how much you want to move versus how much you want to shoot. On the left, you'll notice how hex movement works. So you're going to move out to one hex and then out to another. It'll be one and then two. And the branching paths you choose is how you move through the hexes. Even farther to the left is a list of terrain that you must halt immediately upon entering and you cannot conduct combat. I'm just listing the terrain that's in this scenario, Pegasus Bridge. So you need to stop if you enter a village, if you enter a forest, or of course if you enter barbed wire, you will stop. Now barbed wire is different because if you stop in barbed wire you can still shoot, but the other two you cannot conduct combat. So back to the game. So for moving the unit in the center section, I'm going to move a full two hexes because I'm out of range of shooting another unit. So I might as well get the most out of my unit as I can. For my unit in the left flank, I'm going to move him ahead one unit so I can still fight. And I'm going to move directly into some barbed wire so that's going to stop me. And then I'm going to take a shot in my next phase. So I move both units and I'm done with the move phase. So now we're going to progress to phase four, which is battle. In the battle phase, I only need to focus on units that can conduct battle. In that case, it's our unit in the left flank. So against my better judgment and to speed up this tutorial, I'm going to rush right into battle. Okay, the first thing we need to cover off on is line of sight. Or in other words, once I'm in range, what can I actually shoot at? Line of sight is always measured from the center of the hex you're shooting from to the center of the hex you're shooting to. Now terrain or units, enemy or friendly, can block your line of sight. But if you can draw a line from the point you're shooting at to your target without crossing through a blocked hex, then you have a clear line of sight. Now you'll notice that a couple of these shots pass between hexes and just graze the edge of the forest. Now this is a clear line of sight, but if your line is touched on both sides by a prohibiting text, then your line of sight is blocked. Okay, we're going to zoom in and look at our little suicide skirmish here at Pegasus Bridge. Our unit has line of sight. We can shoot through the barbed wire as well as through the sandbags and attack the Germans. So we're going to take the shot. But first we're going to do a little battle equation to see how many dice we can throw. Normally at close range like this we should be able to roll with three dice, but we are in barbed wire so we get a negative one dice penalty and there's also a sandbag penalty because the enemy is entrenched. So we lose two of those dice and get to shoot with one. So quite literally, this will be the first shot of our reenactment of D-Day at Pegasus Bridge. Now to the right, you'll notice I've unwrapped a dice to show you all the faces. So we're going to walk through those. If we throw our one dice and we get any one of these symbols, what does it mean? First off, let's say we roll a star. Now a star is normally a miss, but with certain tactic cards in plays, you can count it as a hit. But those cards aren't in play here, so that would be a miss. If we roll a tank symbol, then in this scenario, that is also a miss because there are no tanks in play. If there were a tank, then we'd score one hit on the armor and remove one of the tank figurines. Now, if we roll a purple flag, which is just called a flag, then the enemy will retreat one hex. In this scenario, the enemy is behind sandbags, so they can choose to ignore one flag that's rolled. So if we roll that flag, it's not going to do us any good. Under better conditions, rolling more dice, these symbols stack. So if I would rolled two flags, they could only ignore the first one, and then they'd have to retreat one hex, and so on. Now if we roll the grenade, that's the best symbol to roll because it scores a hit on any unit type, whether it's an armor, an infantry, or artillery. In fact, this is the only symbol that can destroy an artillery piece. 
So in this scenario, if we roll a grenade, the enemy would need to remove one figure from their unit. Finally, if we roll the infantry symbol, then the enemy needs to remove one figure from their unit. If you look at the unwrapped dice, you'll notice there are two infantry symbols and the grenade. So that means you can hit an infantry unit 50% of the time with one dice. So now let's flash forward for a second and pretend we'd actually won the battle or forced someone to retreat. So what would happen? Well, we have the option as infantry to take the ground or we can stay put. It's totally up to us. In an armor situation, we can conduct what's called an armor overrun, which basically allows us to plow ahead and conduct one more attack. Now at first it seems really straightforward, but this is actually a pretty key strategy in the game of deciding when and when not to take ground. For example, before you take ground, check to make sure you're not blocking line of sight of one of your other units. Let's just say it happens. Sorry. So after that, let's just say that my first shot in the D-Day invasion at Pegasus Bridge was a miss. Okay, without turning this into a documentary about how crappy of a player I am, let's move on to phase five. In this last phase, I'm gonna draw a command card to end my turn. Now just remember in this Pegasus Bridge scenario, the Germans were surprised, so when they start their turn, they will draw two cards because they're just getting their bits together. From here, the game will continue on alternating between the Axis and the Allies, and the first player to capture four medals wins the game. So we're going to leave it at here and move on to look at some other units. So now I'm going to walk you through some other units and terrain so that you're familiar with them if you decide to play some of the other scenarios. Memoir 44 basically has three units, infantry, armor, and artillery. They just have different flavors with the different expansions and things. Now infantry we just finished, so we know that with infantry we can move two hexes and not battle, or move one hex and battle. Let's look at armor. Armor's really cool because you can move up to three hexes and still battle, and the power of your shot is consistent. So armor is very powerful in this game. With artillery, you have a choice. You can either move them one hex, or you can fire. Now the interesting thing about artillery is they are not impeded by line of sight and terrain. They can shoot up and over things. So you can shoot up to six hexes away. The shot does weaken over the distance. However, the reach with these things is well worth it. The core game gives you a preview of what some of the expansions look like with their special forces. When you add one of the shields on the left to your unit, it gives them special abilities. For example, if you add a special forces shield to armor, for instance, the German commandos symbol, the armor gets one additional figure added. If you add the ranger shield to your infantry unit, then they act as elite infantry, which means simply that they can now move two hexes and battle, whereas the regulars could only move one. The Memoir 44 core set also gives you access to the French Resistance. If the infantry unit has a French Resistance shield, then it has three different modifiers applied. The first is limited numbers. Because the French Resistance was undermanned, you only get three figures per unit. The second is what I call the Home Soil ability. Because the French Resistance are extremely familiar with the territory, they're able to battle upon entering a town or forest. Really, any terrain that would prevent other units from attacking upon entering. Finally, the French resistance can do what I call disappear. So that means for every flag that's rolled, the French resistance can choose to retreat up to three hexes rather than the standard one. So you can imagine if someone rolls multiple flags against the French resistance, they can literally disappear as they can move up to six or nine hexes. This final section is a terrain grid that I've created to try to give you an idea of how the different units interact with the terrain. Artillery ignores most of these terrain rules, so I've not included them in this grid. 
But for infantry and armor, I've laid out here, you can see which terrain blocks line of sight, what are some of the instructions you need to do upon entering, whether you have to halt and not fight, or you can, you're can you okay to go through, or if you just cannot enter at all. You can also quickly check if there's a cover bonus, or if there are battle out territories of the terrain you're in. Memoir 44 does come with terrain cards that help you understand how to play the game, but I think this is just a nice additional helper to get you familiar. And that, my friends, is Memoir 44 by Days of Wonder, designed by the legendary Richard Borg. Like I said at the beginning of the video, if you want to get into tactical wargaming, this is the perfect entry-level game for that. It's very simple. Another great resource is the Days of Wonder site, of course, at daysofwonder.com. And particularly, you can play Memoir 44 online there or through the Steam client. I have an account up on Memoir 44 online, Ben Harsh, so if you want to challenge me up there sometime to a game, I'd love to play you. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh, this is Harsh Rules, and I'll see you on the next episode.